Hey guys, today we are looking at 6.3, which is all about exploring exponential functions. I know the last couple of days we've spent time working on just exploring what the idea of an exponential is and kind of how it behaves. Today we'll get more specific into what the equation looks like, how we evaluate using it, how we uh, identify it from a table, and then get into some graphing and some word problems as well. So, an exponential function follows this equation. We've got y equals a times b to the x power. That's the general form for an exponential. And in that equation, we just have a couple of stipulations, a couple of requirements. We just have to make sure that my a value, that leading number, that leading coefficient, is not zero. So we make sure that you know we actually have values. Um, we have to make sure that that base, my b value, can't be 1, because otherwise I'm just going to be continuously multiplying by 1, and that it is positive. So it's bigger than zero, bigger than zero and not one. If all of those things are true, then we are dealing with an exponential function, exponential. Exponentials, as we saw in both the pay it forward activity, our penny a day activity for our homework, and then with the uh, Desmos activity yesterday that you guys were working on, um, we know that it's a nonlinear function and this is an important thing here I'm going to highlight in blue. It changes by equal factors over those equal intervals. So in linear equations, we looked at how when our, our numbers were spaced out evenly for our x values, there was a constant addition or subtraction in my equation or in my graph or in my table. In a quadratic, sorry, in a exponential function, when we have those equal spacings of our x values, we're looking for a common factor, meaning a common multiplier between the different points of my uh, table. So what we're going to be doing for this first section is just identifying when something is linear or when something is exponential from a table. So as we talked about just a second ago, we have to make sure we have those equal spacings. So as we go from one to the next in our x values that we're checking for, whether it's linear or, or exponential, we have to make sure that we have even spacing between these x values. And here, there's just one unit between all my x values, so we're good. Now we're focusing on the meat of things, the important stuff. For my y values, for my outputs, as I go from one to the next in my y values in my table, if I have a constant addition, like I do here, I'm adding two each step of the way. If I have a constant addition, we know that that is linear. We looked at that back in chapter three, a linear function is a constant rate of change, meaning there's a constant addition or subtraction happening in my outputs, in my y values. Now, with part b, I still have to check to see if there's even spacing, regardless of whether I think it's exponential or linear. We're still adding one each step of the way in my x values. Going from one to the next in my outputs, however, we can see that addition is not going to work. I can add four to get from four to eight. But if I add 4 to 8, it's not going to get me to 16. So hopefully we can see this. And part of it comes with experience and, and being able to recognize these more quickly. But here we're multiplying by 2 to get from 1 to the next in my outputs. So because I have that common multiplication, we can conclude that part B is an exponential. Because we have that common multiplier. Our second skill, our next big one, is evaluating exponentials. Now, this is basically just order of operations. We've done uh, skills similar to this, um, both with our systems, with our linear equations, and even before we even had specific equations we we're looking at, back with function notation. Here, this is just giving us our equation, y equals negative 2 times 5 to the x power, but we're evaluating it when x equals 3. So we're just doing some substitution here. We're just going to be plugging in our 3 in for x and seeing what we get back out. Now, we just have to make sure we follow PEMDAS, parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, and subtract. So here, the important thing is that we always should be evaluating that exponent first before we multiply by that lead number. So here, I have to make sure I do 5 to the third power before I multiply by negative 2 because it'll get very, very different answers. And we have to follow order of operations, so we have to do 5 to the third power, which is 125, 
and then we multiply by 2 to get negative 250. Now whether you do 5 to the third power in your brain, in your head, or whether you use a calculator, it does not matter to me. You guys will always have calculators available to you. Um, but either way you do it, you got to make sure you do 5 to the third power first and then multiply by negative 2 to get negative 250. For part B, uh, same idea. I'm just plugging in negative 2 in for my x value. I'm going to go ahead and rewrite 0 0.5 as a half. I just prefer dealing with fractions instead of decimals. If you're someone who just plans on plugging this stuff right into the calculator and not using your brain, um, then you can just use it as 0 0.5. In fact, it's probably easier on the calculator to, do, to use 0 0.5. But because I like using my brain, I like using my, you know, my knowledge of numbers and being able to do it in my head, I'm going to put it as a fraction because I recognize and hopefully remember that anytime we're dealing with a negative exponent, I have to flip over whatever it's attached to. So instead of one half, I'm going to write this as two over one. So positive two is now being raised to the positive second power. So because that one half was being raised to the negative two, I can flip that fraction over, make it two over one, and now that's a positive two for my exponent. So evaluating the rest of the way, three times two squared is four. So three times four gives me a positive 12. 12 should be my solution there. All right, getting into our graphing side of things. Now, this is going to be a, just a general overview, kind of a, a rough estimation on what our graphs will look like. We will have an entire separate set of notes on steps that we can take to graph easier. But for right now, we're just going to get an idea for what it looks like in more general terms. I know we've graphed some, and we get an, a, a sense of what that curve should look like for exponentials. Um, but here we'll look at it from an equation side of things without a context. So we're starting with y equals 2 to the x power, which is as simple as it can get for our exponential equations. 2 is the smallest number that we'll deal with. It's still a whole number, and there's nothing else going on in my equation. So as we do, anytime we don't know what a graph looks like, or at least we don't know any shortcuts to do, we're just going to be picking some points and evaluating. So I'm going to just start by picking some x values. I'm going to go from negative 2 to positive 3. I'm going to plug in those x values to get y values, and now I've got some points that I can plot to be able to see what the graph looks like. So uh, you can start either way, anywhere you want to, but um, basically this is all just my exponents on 2, right? So 2 to the 0 power is positive 1, 2 to the first power is 2, 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, if I were backwards in my graph, or backwards in my table, 2 to the negative first power is a half, 2 to the negative second power is a fourth. So I can go ahead and plot those points. I've got those five, those, yeah, those six points that I can go ahead and graph. So if I go over to my graph paper, at negative 2, I was at a fourth, negative 1 was a half, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 4, and then 3, 8. So I've got those points. I've got that nice curve that's happening here. Once I have those, those ordered pairs plotted, I'm just going to connect it with a nice smooth curve. So I'm going to do my best to make it as smooth as possible, but still go through all of my points. That looks lovely. Now, something that naturally happens when I'm graphing these, um, and we'll, we'll put a specific name to it, um, in a, in a second here, we kind of have this natural curve that my line gets really, really close to. And in this case, that, that line, that boundary is at zero. My numbers get really, really close to zero the further to the left that I go. So if I plugged in like a really, really big negative number for my x value, that means two to the really big negative number gives me a really, really small number, right? Because if it was like two to the negative 10th power, that's the same thing as 2, 1 over 2 to the 10th, which 2 to the 10th is a really big number, which means it's a really, really small number because 1 over that big number makes a really, really tiny fraction. But if you notice, it's not 0. No matter what number I plug in here, the giantest, biggest negative number that I can think of, I'm never going to actually hit 0. Because nothing, like 2 to, 2 to some power, is never going to give me 0. It's never going to give me nothing. It's either going to be 1 or a really, really small number, 
but never actually zero. So this idea of getting really, really close to zero, but never actually hitting it, we have this line that all of my exponentials have is called an asymptote. And again, that's pronounced without the P. That P is silent in that word. Um, it's asym, asymptote, asymptote. Sometimes I'll, I'll say it goofy just to emphasize how to spell it because people always forget the P in there. Um, so I will say an, an, an asymptote, just a little, little to make sure you remember that it's asymptote. But the way you would actually say it is asymptote. You do not pronounce the P at all. It is not asymptote. It is not asymptote. I'm just goofy, and that's how I get you guys to remember how to spell asymptote. So an asymptote is a point or a, a, a value in my graph that my, my function gets really, really close to, but never actually hits. It's kind of like a force field. But as we move forward to my, like in the next set of notes for 6.3, we'll get more specific into identifying where that happens first and using that to be able to graph my curve with fewer number of points, which is really nice. All right, flipping on over to the back side of your notes, graphing with some translations here. Um, if I had my graph um, for my equation was y equals 2 to the x power plus 3. So I'm trying to graph basically the same equation, but adding three into my equation afterwards. I can use the information that I know. I, I know if I use the same x values, negative two to positive three, I'm basically taking this table up above, one fourth, one half, one, two, four, and eight, and just adding three to all three of the, or all six of those values. So this should be two to the zero power is one, plus three is four, 2 to the first power is 2, plus 3 is 5, 2 squared is 4, plus 3 is 7, 2 cubed is 8, plus 3 is 11, and then as you work backwards in your table, negative 1 gave me a half originally, so add 3 and I get 3 and a half, or 3.5 if you're a decimal person, and then 2 to the negative second power was a fourth, so plus 3 would be 3 and 1 fourth, or 3.25, depending on your philosophical beliefs, and if you're a decimal person. So I'm still going to go ahead and start by plotting our points. So on our graph, at negative 2, we were up at 3 and a quarter. At negative 1, we were at 3 and a half. 0, we were at 4. 1 was at 5. 2, 7. And then 3 was 11. So it's going to be just barely off my graph a little bit. And again, I'm going to go ahead and plot that curve. You can see my graph kind of does this nice smooth curve, and it flattens out around 3. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue that curve as it is. Positive 3 is where that asymptote happens for this particular function. Again, if you can see that connection to what my graph, what my equation is now and where my asymptote happens for my graph, that's awesome. You're ahead of the game if you can figure that out. If not, if you don't see it, if you don't make that connection quite yet between what my graph looks like and what the equation was, um, we'll be able to fix that and figure that out as we get into more specific with graphing stuff. But there we are. There it is graphed. Something we haven't talked about um, yet or utilized yet is that a value in my equation. In the, in the equation y equals a times b to the x power, my b value, that's my base, which means that's my multiplier. That's how I get from one to the next in my table or one to the next for my y values in my graph. The a value that we haven't used yet is my starting value. It's my starting value or starting value, or it could also be called, in most cases, my y-intercept. My y-intercept. So if you go back to that first graph that we did, even though we didn't see uh, an a value in here, as always, if I don't see a coefficient, it's always an imaginary one there. And if you look at my graph, hey, look, my starting value right here at positive one. Ooh, cool. So very much like our, y, our b value, we're going to just cross that table out. We're not going to utilize that here. Like my B value in slope intercept form, that's going to be my Y intercept, which is awesome. It's a good, good head start for us. 
All right, last but not least, a real life application problem. So in this problem, we are given a graph that represents bacteria growth over time. Here our Y value is the population of the bacteria and our X value is time. So it's the number of days that have gone by. So in this, my graph gives me six, no, sorry, five different coordinates, five different ordered pairs, which is the bacteria population for five different days. If we're trying to write the equation, which is what we're asked to do in part A, we need two different things. We need the starting value and we need the multiplier. So if we go back to what our equation looks like, y equals a times b to the x power. Again, this y value or this a value is our starting value, which was again our y intercept. This b value is my multiplier. So for most of us, it's probably going to be easier to work from a table rather than a graph. You're not required to do this at all, but for most of us, again, it's going to be easier if we look at our, our information from the table instead of from the graph. At least from what I saw with the Desmos activity, in general, most of us were able to handle it a little bit easier when we were dealing with the table rather than the graphs. Most of us had a little bit better of a time doing that. So I'm just taking here and translating those ordered pairs from my graph over into a table. So 0, 3, 1, 12, 2, 48, 3, 192, and then 4, 768. So what I'm trying to figure out here are those two values. I need my starting value, my y-intercept, and I need to figure out my multiplier. Well, for most of us, I would say the multiplier is the easier of the two. Looking at what I'm multiplying by to get from one to the next in my table, three times four gives me 12. So if I just check some more of those, 12 times four does give me 48. If you use the calculator, 48 times four is 192. 192 times four is 768. So we have that my multiplier, my B value is four, which is good. So we've got four to the X power. We still need to figure out what that A value is, what that starting value is. Now, in my function, just like in a linear function, if we were looking for my y-intercept, it's always the point where my, my x value is 0. So this point that I just highlighted, 0, 3, that is my y-intercept. That's where it crosses the y-axis. When x value is 0, my y value is 3, which tells me that my A is positive 3. So my equation, my answer for part A, is y equals 3 times 4 to the x power. Part B is asking me to find the population after certain lengths of time, which is really just a, a fancy version, a word problem version of asking us to evaluate for particular x values. Because the, the things that I'm given are times, our, our lengths of time, which is our x value, so we're just basically plugging in numbers for x. In this first one, find the population after 12 hours, I'm going to be plugging in a number for my x value. So 3 times 4 to the, I need to figure out what that is. Now be careful, I can't just plug in 12 here, because if we look back at my graph, what my x represents is days. That's our time unit here, is number of days. So I can't plug in 12 because it hasn't been 12 days. It's only been 12 hours. So hopefully we all know that a, a day is 24 hours. I'm hoping I'm not just assuming that um, and people don't know that a day is 12 hours. It is, um, which means that, or sorry, a day is 24 hours, which means 12 hours is half a day, right? So we're plugging in a half in there for my X value. Now this is a little bit weird. We haven't really done any of these yet. This is something that um, we don't usually cover in depth until Algebra 2, um, but something that we should be aware of is that when we raise something to the one-half power, that's the same thing as taking the square root of that number. So 4 to the one-half power is the same thing as the square root of 4. You could also use a calculator to evaluate this if you don't remember that off the top of your head. You could just go to your calculator and do 4 to the one-half power. It'll get you positive 2 because that's what the square root of 4 is. So when we multiply by 3, we should get 6 bacteria.
six bacteria after six, after 12 hours. That's our answer for that first part for part B. For the second one, uh, it's a little more straightforward. We were evaluating to find out the population after five days. Since our X unit is measured in days, we can just do three times four to the fifth power. Uh, I wouldn't expect most of us or any of us to really do this in our head. I had to use a calculator when I was doing this before. That's not a very common one. Four to the fifth power is 1,024. So when I multiply by three, I get 3,072 bacteria. 3,072 bacteria. All right, that is all I got for us for today. Uh, your homework is up there on the screen, page 310, 6 through 24, just the evens. As always, if you guys have any questions, concerns, thoughts, ideas, hopes, or dreams, make sure you guys are reaching out and letting me know. Otherwise, have a good day. We'll see you soon.